Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. I'm your host, Holly Spear. And I'm Kylie Colwell. This time, Kate's missing in action. You just have Kylie and I today. Kate's dealing with some baby, baby drama. Not baby daddy drama, just Not baby, baby drama. Da- just baby drama. Millie's just really stirring up the drama. So you have Kylie and I today. And it is my case today. And before we get started... I just wanted to give a quick shout out to all of our listeners. We really have been appreciating your support and your listens and your follows, everything that you guys do, keeping up with our episodes and interacting with us. We love it so much. And we just want to keep pushing forward and having you guys like and follow. So please, if you enjoy the podcast and you want to support us, you know, we don't ask for any like monetary donations or subscriptions or anything but it would really help us out if you could leave us a review or even a comment tell us what you like about the show so with that we will go ahead and get started this is the story of a woman still in the prime of her life a mom of teenage kids and a devoted wife a woman who made a name for herself in her career as a realtor a name that everyone in the town knew a woman who was kind and compassionate And she would become another victim simply because she was a woman alone at the wrong time. This is Beverly Carter's story. So Kylie, Kate was here. She would also be included in this, but I know that both of us at least are familiar with Little Rock, Arkansas. In fact, that's where I'm sitting right now. I've heard of it. For all you new listeners, it's the place where all three of us met. Nice little town. I do miss it. She's humble. She's humble, babe. Little Rock is a city located in the central part of Arkansas along the Arkansas River. It's a capital, so it's kind of the hub for government and business in the state. It's a city of about 200,000-ish people, according to the 2022 National Census. Compared to big cities in the U.S., she's small. But for many rural Arkansans, Little Rock is the quote-unquote big city. It's their big city. It offers a blend of urban amenities with some southern charm. But Little Rock does have its downfalls. Little Rock has continued to struggle with higher-than-average crime rates, particularly violent crimes such as homicides and aggravated assaults, as well as property and drug-related crimes. In fact, Little Rock was listed as one of the nation's most dangerous cities. With a crime rate of 72 per 1,000 residents, Little Rock has one of the highest crime rates in America compared to all communities of its size. One's chances of becoming a victim of either a violent or property crime is 1 in 14. So that's pretty shocking. Thank God I made it out of there alive. I know. I'm still here. So thoughts and prayers. This is where 50-year-old Beverly Carter lives. Beverly Carter is a very successful real estate agent here in the state. She's actually one of the top 10. She is very recognizable by her billboards that were all over town. And they're her face big on the billboards. So you would know if you saw her. It was September 25th, a normal fall day in 2014. Beverly spent the day at her office. The real estate company that she worked for was called Cry Like Realtors. It's a pretty typical day for her. Beverly gets a call around 2 o'clock that day. It was a man and his wife. They wanted to tour a home right outside of town. The man and his wife wanted to know if they could do a quick walkthrough that afternoon to see if they were interested. Even though Beverly already had a full day planned, she tells them, of course, she'd be happy to show them the home. And actually, the showing would work out quite perfectly Because the home was actually only a couple miles from her and her husband's home. So she can get off work, she can stop in, show the house, and then head home for the night. And I imagine this is pretty typical. People call towards the end of the workday and want to see a house. Most people don't get off till 5 or 5.30. So that would be really the only time that they could go see it. So that's pretty normal. But one thing that Beverly is cautious about is going to show a home alone to someone that she's never met. I never really thought about how dangerous this would be for real estate agents, for men and women alike, but especially women, to be showing houses alone to strangers that they've never met. 
You basically go into a home and close the door behind you. Actually, pretty terrifying. But Beverly is a seasoned professional. She's been doing this for a while, and she knows that she needs to be aware of what she's getting herself into. Beverly asks the man if he plans on bringing his wife with him. And he says, yeah, he does. Actually, he hands the phone to his wife, and Beverly ends up talking to the wife and confirms that she will be there. So, great. Also, like I said, the house is just a few miles from Beverly's. It's basically in her backyard. She also tells people in her office the address that she's showing the house to and who she's showing it to. She's going to meet the couple at the house, show them around, and then head home. So a little before six, Beverly called her husband, Carl, and told him that she was going to show this house a couple streets down. And if he wanted her to, she'd pick up dinner before she headed back home. So time begins to pass and Carl begins to worry. Carl's texting his wife and he's getting no reply. It's about 830 now. Carl calls his son, Carl Jr., to see if he has talked to his mother. Carl Jr. tells his dad actually no, and he's been trying to get a hold of her too. Carl Jr. says his dad is really protective of his mother, and his dad was really prone to worrying probably a little too much. He tells his dad that she's probably fine. She's working. She's trying to sell a house. She's probably running numbers for this couple or something. Carl tells his dad, look, I'll just go drive by her work. You go drive by this house that she's showing. It's right down the road. We'll split up. Call when you find her. So Carl hops in his car and drives over. Meanwhile, Carl Jr. arrives at the office parking lot to see it's deserted, a completely dark building. When Carl Sr. gets to the house for sale, he's relieved to see Beverly's car. It's parked right outside the house. Her purse is still in the passenger seat. There's no other cars in the driveway, so he assumes that she's just finishing up the showing. Maybe she's turning lights off, closing up, cleaning up. He's feeling pretty relieved. But as he walks up to the house, that feeling of relief is gone. He sees the front door is wide open. The house is dark, quiet, and eerie. No trace at all that anyone had even been there. Carl Sr. calls his son, and the son confirms she's not at the office. Carl Jr. gets off the phone and calls the police to report his mom missing. Police arrive at the house, and they start searching. All that is left in the empty house is dust. But investigators notice that when they shine their flashlights into the dark home, they can see the dust like on a layer on the wood floor, and they can tell that it had recently been walked through. But it was not just footprints. It was an area at the bottom of the stairs that drew their attention. It was probably a 10 by 10 area where the dust was completely disturbed. It looked like someone had laid down in it, maybe rolled around in it. They searched through Beverly's car, and laying in the front passenger seat was a notebook. The notebook that Beverly used to keep all of her appointments. The page in the notebook had three different addresses, and one of them was the house that they were at. And there was an email address and a phone number under that address. Obviously, the contact information for the clients Beverly was meeting. Police start tracking the email and the phone number. In the meantime, police keep searching the scene. Police could tell that there were tire tracks that went from the driveway to a little area of grass, and it looked like it backed up to the front door. Car had just completely like plowed through it, and they could tell from the grass that a car had been backed up to the door. So there's a home within eyesight of the house that Beverly was showing. Police walk over and they ask the neighbor if they happened to see anything odd the night before. This neighbor tells police that he hadn't seen anything odd, nothing that stuck out to him, just that he noticed there was a car parked outside the home and then another black car pulled in around six and parked behind the car. Nothing weird for a house for sale, but the neighbor looked out a few minutes later and saw that the black car had backed up to the front door. Obviously what we were just talking about from the tire tracks. Then he saw a tall, slender white male with short brown hair stand beside the car. All of a sudden, Carl actually receives a text message. It was from Beverly. It said, sorry, my phone's been dead. I'm out having drinks with friends. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. And that's what Carl thinks. Her whole family is like, no, first of all, she's not a drinker. And number two, anyone that she would have gone and gotten a drink with, they were already there on the scene searching for Beverly. She had a tight circle of friends and all of them were already with her family looking for her. Number three, she wouldn't have just gone out for drinks and left her car 
her keys, her purse, her money, her ID, her bank cards, and just go out. Like, it's just not happening. No, I don't think she would have even left her car there. Even if you had someone pick you up, it wouldn't be at some random house you were showing. Yeah, and how are you going to pay for your drinks? What if you get ID'd? I mean, it's just, there's no way. Luckily, the police don't agree. So, the police get a warrant for exigent circumstances and ping Beverly's phone. Now, if you don't know, which we don't expect a lot of people to know, usually when police need a warrant, they have to go ask a judge for it before they can conduct a search, seizure, or arrest. Which, if it was an arrest, you need an arrest warrant. Officers must provide enough evidence to show probable cause, and it needs to be specific about the location to be searched, the person to be arrested, or what police are looking for. So they would need statements or facts or evidence or all of that to show enough probable cause to believe that the crime has been committed. A judge will then review it and determine if there is enough evidence for the warrant to be issued. And most of all, out of this, this takes time. Lots of collecting evidence, gathering facts, writing it up into a legal document. But luckily, for situations like this, police can basically bypass a warrant and claim that there are exigent circumstances. They can bypass a lot of the requirements when there's no time to get a warrant due to danger of life, destruction of evidence, or escape of a suspect. Like now, where Beverly may still be alive. So police ping Beverly's phone, and the pings show that Beverly arrived at the house, then her phone shows her leaving the house, then it shows her going down the interstate, and then her phone just shuts off. Police quickly go and search the last location that her phone pinged, which was along the interstate, and they were able to trace her last location as being close to a commuter lot on the side of the interstate. And her phone was there for about 20 to 25 minutes. And a commuter lot, a lot of Probably most people know what that is, but it's just, you know, a lot where you might meet up and catch a ride. There's a lot of them in Little Rock because a lot of people live outside of the city and drive into work. And so they'll meet at the commuter lot beside the interstate and ride together to work. Police are certain at this point that there is foul play involved. They start looking into options. Of course, they start asking Carl questions. We know that police start with the husband. No new news there. While this is happening, police are waiting to get a report back about who was tied behind the email and the phone number that was written in Beverly's notebook. So unlike a lot of cases we cover, this investigation is actually moving pretty fast. The police interview Carl, and police find out that Beverly and Carl were kind of going through a little bit of financial troubles, and there had been some heated arguments in the past, but nothing that raised huge red flags. Yes, they'd had their rough patches, but Carl said that things were good and there was nothing that would have ever caused him to hurt his wife. It's you know, always funny in investigations when they're looking at a spouse, obviously you have to do that. And they're like, oh, there's, they had some difficulties, rough patches. I feel like that's every relationship. Yeah, every relationship. And I mean, I get that also financial troubles can signal a big red flag for police, but this was kind of at a time where the housing market was not very strong. Beverly was one of the top real estate agents, but. We know the housing market fluctuates frequently. I'm no realtor, but I do know from just hearing people talk that that's a big thing. So it was, they were, their relationship was fine. Their kids thought their relationship was fine. Um, there was really no reason to get hung on Carl. And police don't for too long because they finally get back the information on who Beverly was meeting. They get an IP address for that email written in her notebook. They find out that the telephone number was a fake number. No surprise there. It was one of those numbers that you can get from a tax-free app. So police have to send a subpoena to that app company to find out who that fake number was issued to. They find out that it was actually issued to a woman, a woman named Crystal Lowry, a name that no one had heard before, not police, not Beverly's family, nor any of her friends. After a little bit more digging, they find out that Crystal Lowry is actually married to a man named Aaron Lewis. And this name does ring a bell for police, a big bell. Aaron Lewis was a convicted felon with an extensive rap sheet. Police find an address for Lewis. It was a home that he shared with his wife, Crystal, right outside of Little Rock. Police pay a visit to Aaron's residence where they find a black car in the driveway a car that matched the neighbor's description of the car that was parked outside the house. 
police get lucky and at that moment a tall skinny guy matching the neighbor's description walks out of the house to get in his car but before he gets in he glances up at the unmarked cars sitting outside his house with random men sitting in them and he immediately bolts he jumps in his car and flees shocker yeah so police are involved in a full-on chase but it doesn't last too long before Lewis makes a 90 degree turn and loses control and runs off the road. He hits a ditch and he's stuck. As police pull up, Aaron is trying to climb out of his car window. I always just love police chases because they hardly ever don't end really funny. Like think that you're gonna outrun people. I mean, you might for a second, but then you're gonna get caught. You're, they'll get you eventually. Has there ever been a case of someone getting away in a chase? I'm sure for like a little bit, but then all the ones that I've ever covered in these stories, they are not able to drive that fast and they crash their car and then they're like halfway climbing out of the window or, you know, sprinting down the road when police pull up. Yeah, at some point they're going to bring the helicopters out and there's no hiding. Can't hide from a helicopter, no. And this is not the sharpest tool in the shed. So Aaron is first sent to the hospital because he's just gone through this little one car crash. And on the way, he asked police if they could call his wife for him. And police are like, sure, what's your wife's number? And Aaron gives police the same number that Beverly has written down in her notebook. Oh, so he's stupid. So he's dumb, dumb. Yeah. Oh, we love dumb criminals, though. And police sees his phone. They get a search warrant to go through it that will be very simple. Aaron is technically not under arrest yet because he's still in the hospital. So there's really not someone watching him at all times. I think there's just maybe someone standing outside his door sometimes or like in the lobby waiting to talk to him. Not really sure how this happens, but once Aaron gets settled in nice and cozy in his hospital bed, he just he just bolts again. He flees, this time on foot. Oh, I feel like that shouldn't, that's not standard protocol. Yeah, I don't know what we were doing, but we weren't watching him very close because he's he's gone. While some of the officers are checking, looking around for Aaron, investigators go and talk to Aaron's wife, Crystal. They ask Crystal to come in and answer a few questions, and she actually agrees. She tells investigators that she doesn't know anything. She doesn't know anything about Beverly, even who she is. She said that she was married to Aaron, but they weren't getting along. They both wanted a divorce and she wasn't keeping up with what he was doing or who he was talking to. They end up holding Crystal on an unrelated misdemeanor warrant while they search for Aaron. Police are still very hopeful that Beverly is alive. They haven't found any real evidence that would suggest otherwise. They are hoping that she's being held somewhere, or maybe Aaron kidnapped her and then dropped her off in the middle of nowhere. Every second that goes by is another second Beverly could be fighting for her life. Police put out Aaron's picture everywhere, and in the meantime, police do a search of Aaron and Crystal's home. Police found a lot of remnants of criminal activity in their home. They actually found some, like, skimming equipment. If you don't know what that is, it's like a machine that skims credit cards that are swiped. They, like, copy the information off the credit card so that they can then, like, draw money out of people's accounts. My worst fear at gas stations? Yeah. Have you seen those videos where there's, like, a machine on top of the machine and that's like a skimmer yeah the people like pulled them off i always check yeah, now they, i guess that's what they all look like i don't know i've never seen a skimmer that i know of i guess you wouldn't know until it's too late <laughs> until you've been skimmed and scammed so actually in the house they find beverly's cell phone this is all police need to get an arrest warrant for both crystal and aaron By this time, everyone in the city knew the well-known real estate agent and mom, Beverly Carter, was missing and had been kidnapped. And now that Aaron Lewis was likely responsible. It didn't take long for police to get a tip that someone had spotted Aaron Lewis. And while the caller was on the phone, Aaron Lewis actually noticed the man on the phone and took off running. An officer at that moment showed up and was able to find Lewis still running and he went into a random apartment complex with a cop chasing behind him and he jumped off the second story balcony. What a guy. He's dedicated to the run. That's all I know. The chase, he lives for it. I love dumb criminals. Love them. 
So when he jumps off the second story balcony, he lands like right beside an officer that was standing outside the building. And so he just like handcuffs him right there. It's pretty easy. It's like a freaking movie. So now he's been captured for the third time. The police take him down to the station. Now, police start to read him his rights and he interrupts and he says that if police want to know any information, he wants to be put in a room with no recorders and no video cameras. So police are like, for sure, of course, let me set that up for you. But Arkansas is a one party consent state, meaning that only one party involved in a conversation needs to be aware that the conversation is being recorded. So if you're part of a conversation, you can legally record it without informing the other party. In two party states, both parties would need to be aware and consent to the recording. But I don't know if this even matters because police are allowed to use deceptive tactics or lie in interrogation anyway. So yeah, so they're like, for sure, for sure. Either way, Aaron thinks he's sitting down in a cameraless, recorderless room when he sits down and confesses to the kidnapping of Beverly Lewis. Aaron claims that he and Crystal needed money for their divorce, so they plan to kidnap Beverly and send a photo of her being kidnapped to her husband Carl and demand ransom money from him. Aaron claimed that they knew she would have money because she was a real estate broker. Okay, wait, did he think confessing in a room with no cameras or recording devices was going to make this just not real? That's the only thing I can think of, that he thought that he could confess and then later be like, no, I didn't. I never said that. But Aaron didn't do any of this. He never sent Carl any pictures of his wife being kidnapped. He never demanded ransom from anyone. Aaron tells police that if they'll just give him back his phone, he'll prove that this was his only motive for kidnapping Beverly. Police are skeptical, obviously, about giving the suspect evidence in the case, but they're still operating under the idea that Beverly is still alive. So to appease Aaron, they give him his phone back and Aaron actually plays a recording for the investigators. And the recording is Beverly herself. Carl, it's Beverly. I just want to let you know I'm okay. I haven't been hurt. Just do what he says and please don't call the police. If you call the police, it could be bad. Just want you to know I love you very much. Lewis claimed that Beverly was still alive and that he would lead police to where she was being held. This recording was definitely Beverly and she was calm. Lewis explains that she was being held in a town called Cabot, which is about 45 minutes from Little Rock. So police immediately throw him in the car and they head to Cabot. The whole ride there, Aaron is just talking, as these people tend to do. He tells officers that he picked Beverly because she was a real estate broker, so he knew that she would be rich. He tells police he arrived at the home for sale and pretended like he wanted to walk through. He then asked Beverly to take some pictures of the upstairs bathroom for his wife. So Beverly walked up the stairs with Aaron behind her and into the bathroom. She turned around to take the pictures and Aaron came up behind her and pulled out a taser. He clicked it and told Beverly, you're fixing to have a bad day. Lewis said that he did all of this with an accomplice, but it wasn't his wife. It was a man named Trevor. He claimed Trevor was in the Air Force and was supposed to stay and keep Beverly hostage for $100,000. So he was going to get a cut of the money for holding her. Police and Aaron approach the old shed in the middle of nowhere in Cabot, and Aaron tells police this is where he left Beverly, with Trevor watching over her. But Beverly isn't there, nor is this Trevor. And actually, there's no sign or trace of Beverly ever being there. Investigators said that actually the shed was clean and tidy. It didn't look like one thing out of place. It didn't look like anyone had been in there in a while. It didn't seem like somebody was locked in here for sure. I have a feeling that Trevor does not exist. You're close. But Lewis is like, no, no, no. This is Trevor's fault. Th it must be another place. Trevor must have taken her to another place. He takes detectives about an hour and a half down the road to a large abandoned house. Lewis tells investigators she's in there. You'll find her handcuffed to an iron beam. Police enter. No Beverly, no handcuffs, no iron beam. By this time, police had actually tracked down this Trevor guy that Aaron claimed had Beverly. He does exist. He was not in Arkansas at this time or at the time of Beverly's disappearance. He was in Oklahoma and he had a pretty solid alibi. Trevor did tell investigators he did know Aaron and he knew his wife, Crystal. 
and that Crystal was his partner in all of his criminal events, and Crystal would have been the one helping Aaron. He said that Aaron and Crystal were con artists, they're criminals, they would get money any way that they could. Police keep pressing Aaron, but they're getting nowhere. He's not even replying to police's questions at this point. But one thing police did learn was that Aaron used to be employed at a concrete plant called Argos, but had recently been fired about two weeks prior to Beverly's kidnapping. One officer just decides to randomly ask, did you take her to Argos? Aaron had his head bowed the entire time, but at that moment, he raises it up and looks straight at the investigator. It was the first reaction from Aaron in about 12 hours. After that, police knew. It's now Tuesday, September 30th. Police rush to the Argos concrete plant to search for Beverly Carter. They began searching the property. It didn't take long for police to notice something odd sticking out of the ground. It was a human elbow. Any small hope that the family and friends of Beverly Carter were carrying was crushed. Police began to uncover the body of Beverly from her shallow grave. About 70 yards away, police found one of Beverly's earrings, a shoe, and a roll of duct tape. When her body was uncovered, police found that her body was pretty much wrapped in duct tape. She had green duct tape wrapped around her arms, and then they were taped behind her back. Her feet were taped together, and her entire head was wrapped in tape. She suffocated from the tape. Investigators took pictures of the scene and returned to the police station, still covered in dirt and mud. They burst into the interview room of Aaron Lewis and slapped down pictures of her body in front of Aaron. Aaron didn't say a word. He didn't even look up. Beverly Carter's son, Carl Jr., said he remembered the ring at the doorbell at 4.30 in the morning. He'd not slept in days, and he'd been worrying nonstop. He said standing at his door was a group of women, his mother's friends and colleagues. The women had been there for the family the whole time. Carl remembers asking, is she okay? And he said he heard the words, no baby, she's not. It still haunts him to this day. Both Aaron Lewis and Crystal Lowry were arrested on capital murder charges. Of course, as we know, one of them is gonna turn on the other, no surprise. And surprise, surprise, Crystal decides to testify against her husband. She says that it was her idea to kidnap a broker. She chose to kidnap a realtor that was a broker because she said, quote, they have a lot of money. So they simply Google searched brokers and realtors, and Beverly was just the first to pop up. Crystal tells her side of the story, and it's that Aaron called Beverly and said that he and his wife wanted to buy a house and wanted to know if they could tour one that they had their eye on. Beverly asked if his wife was going to be with him. Aaron assured Beverly his wife would be there, and he then put Crystal on the phone who lied and said she would be there. Crystal was planning on just letting her husband do all the dirty work. Lewis met Beverly at the house, and then, like I said, he tricked her into taking pictures of the upstairs bathroom for him, and then he threatened to tase her. Aaron forced Beverly into the back of his car, and then he took her to that commuter lot off the interstate and stayed there for about 25 minutes, just like the phone showed. He took a photograph of Beverly tied up in the back of the car and sent the photo to Crystal. So... The plan was that Crystal was then going to send this picture to Carl and demand ransom money. Meanwhile, the plan was for Aaron to take Beverly to an abandoned house in the nearby town of Cabot. But Aaron remembered that a couple days prior he'd seen someone at this house. So he kind of panicked because he didn't have anywhere to take Beverly. And he ends up taking her back to him and Crystal's house. He takes Beverly inside and locks her in their bathroom. And Crystal, the wife, she's pissed because this was not the plan. Now they have this woman locked in the bathroom. They have prescription bottles in there with their names on them. Beverly now knows who they are and where they live. Their plan's kind of going to shit. Plus, Aaron forgot Beverly's purse in her car. So they don't have any debit cards of Beverly's, which was pretty much the idea is they were going to like get her pin and start stealing money off her debit cards and credit cards and stupid dumb criminals man i don't know so while beverly's locked up in the bathroom aaron tries to go back and get her purse out of her car but he drives by and by this time everyone is searching for beverly and the cops are already actually at the house so beverly's killer was actually unknowingly to police driving by the scene when she went missing crystal decides on her own they need to have her killed 
She knows our names, she knows our faces, our home, our car, everything. So it's actually Crystal's idea to kill Beverly. So Aaron being the obedient little mouse that he is, he loads Beverly up in Crystal's car and drives Beverly out to Argo's concrete plant. He walks her out to a spot in the yard and duct tapes her arms and her legs and her entire head. And then he leaves her, suffocating under the duct tape that he's put around her head. That is so cruel. And then he goes home and he gets something to eat. Yes. Disgusting. So all murders are obviously horrible and horrendous, but I just, he can't stomach killing her, whatever. So he makes her die a horrible, painful death, suffocating under duct tape and just can't even watch. So he goes home and grabs a little bite to eat. He's a little bitch. Yeah, I hate him. (sighs) Later that night after Aaron had his little snack and Crystal was just being lazy, Aaron goes to Walmart and surveillance footage actually captures him going in. Crystal sends him a text message while he's in there and says, it's a shovel idiot, not rocket science. Pick one and let's go. Kind of makes me think that she's in the car waiting on him. It doesn't say that. And I think she's trying to like keep herself reserved from being involved in this killing. But it sounds to me like she's in the car. I think so. That's what it sounds like. So he buys a shovel and lazy Crystal holds a flashlight for the scientist Aaron while he digs a half ass shallow grave for Beverly Carter. Now, that's a story that Crystal Lowry testifies to. But Aaron Lewis has a different story, which he tells because, surprise, surprise, he decides to represent himself and take the stand. I love to see it. Of course he does. <laughs> that is my favorite. I love it when they do that. So as we talk about a lot on here, many psycho killers with a superiority complex want to get up and testify in their defense at trial or represent themselves. If you have a good lawyer, they're going to tell you to not do this because it's simply idiotic. And actually, I would say that Aaron Lewis is just a narcissistic psycho. But I seem to think that he's just an idiot. It seems like Crystal's calling the shots. Yeah, Crystal has a little bit of brains. Aaron is deficient. But of course, Aaron does, and the prosecution is forced to hand deliver to Aaron the discovery against him. So the case files of evidence against him. Aaron basically just gets to take the binders so he can craft his own little story. So. Instead of building his case to bring to the jury, Aaron arranges to have his version posted on his Facebook page. So instead of telling the jury his story, he just starts posting it on Facebook. I don't know where the heck he is that he has access to Facebook. I would think he would be arrested during this time. I think he is arrested during this time because later he talks about how he doesn't have access to law books. Sorry, you don't just get a right to that, but he's posting all of this on Facebook, which is just really crazy. I've seen very select few prisons. I don't know about if you're being held pre-trial, you get social media. But I have seen defendants, quote unquote, post on Facebook. They give what to post to other people and they post it for them. Oh, okay. Okay, that could be it. I mean, it could be Crystal. Who knows? Who knows? His Facebook told the whole wide world that he and Crystal met Beverly at a strip club in Memphis and that she had died during sex between Beverly and Crystal. Okay. And then Aaron was forced to clean up their mess and bury Beverly. Out of all of the defenses you could come up with from that binder of evidence, the jump from what actually happened to that is insane. Yeah, as I as I like to say, like the dots that you're connecting are very far in between each other like that's where'd you get that like he was he literally pulled it out you know not even a strip club in town a strip club in a different state obviously this is the dumbest thing that anyone's ever heard where did the email and phone number come from listed under the house for sale that beverly was last seen at why did they meet at a house for sale why did the neighbors see them pull their black car up to the back of the home 
Why was she bound in duct tape? Why did she die from strangulation? Um, just very obvious questions that don't even need to be brought up, but Aaron had a hard time playing attorney, and the judge convinces Aaron to let him appoint him an attorney to represent himself in conjunction with himself. So he's basically working with an attorney to represent himself, if that makes sense. He still, he still wants to be his own defense, but the judge convinces him to get an attorney appointed. Basically, it's like giving him a legal assistant that is a real attorney, but at the end of the day, it's still him calling the shots. Exactly. So now that Aaron has a lawyer helping him, his lawyer begs him not to testify. But no surprise here, Aaron is like, no, I want to talk. Of course. But glad he did because it made for a very short jury deliberation. After just 25 minutes, the jury returned and came back with a guilty verdict. Guilty of capital murder and kidnapping of the mother, wife, and real estate agent Beverly Carter. Aaron was sentenced on both counts to life in prison. Crystal Lowry also pled guilty in her trial and was sentenced to life, but per her deal with the prosecutors to testify against her husband, her sentence was reduced to 30 years. A world record jury deliberation. He made it very short and sweet and simple for them. Love it. Beverly's son gave a victim impact statement during the sentencing phase. He told the jury that not only had they been robbed of their mother, but that they were further brutalized by Lewis's claim that the crime in some way, shape, or form involved some kind of consensual relationship between Crystal and Beverly. Reporters asked Lewis, why Beverly? Lewis responded, because she was a woman alone. And now I'd like to take the time to talk a little bit about how actually terrifying it can be to be a woman, girl, or even a man. Um, I don't want to say that only women experience violence because it would be untrue. We've sat on this podcast and told many stories of violence against men as well. Crimes or unsolved cases about men who disappear and where they're murdered. But statistically, women are targeted more for crimes like this at a much higher rate. Carl Jr. is now all grown up. He started speaking publicly about his mother's death. He said he started speaking publicly because people would say things like, only reckless agents get robbed or killed. Obviously, this infuriated him. His mother wasn't reckless. In fact, she'd done nearly everything right. Unfortunately, Beverly was just a woman doing her job, and she happened to be alone at the wrong time, which is a situation that is not foreign to pretty much all women today. Carl Jr. has created a real estate training course highlighting who his mother was and also incorporating tips for other realtors to follow so that they can keep this horrific tragedy from happening to them. His mother's case is a testament to the idea that you can never be too cautious. She made sure another woman would be there. The home was right by her house. Her husband knew she was there. Her office knew she was there. She did so much right. Carl has created the Beverly Carter Foundation, a nonprofit whose mission is to improve safety for all real estate agent professionals. The website is beverlycarterfoundation.org. But this episode is obviously not just for real estate agents. Obviously, any young women, all women, men too, danger is waiting in unexpected places. So it's crucial to stay vigilant and aware, whether it's walking alone at night, meeting someone new, or just going about your daily routine. Trust your instincts, keep a high sense of awareness, and always have an emergency plan. The National Crime Prevention Council, NCPC, that is just ncpc.org. So if you have like two minutes, read it over. It's super fast. I know that it can be kind of annoying or just like seem non-significant to like read over. Maybe just send it to someone you love and maybe they'll take two minutes to read it and it will keep something from happening to them. No, you always and, think you're being super safe, but then sometimes you'll read a tip that it's something you hadn't thought of. Yeah, of for sure. I mean, just listening to True Crime podcasts, there's so many things that they suggest you do that I've never thought of before. And I think it could actually really be beneficial to people. So share this episode and go on this ncpc.org. If you're a real estate agent or a working professional, visit the Beverly Carter Foundation.org for some more safety tips on there. Fun fact, the story I'm currently researching to do for my next case is also a lone woman real estate agent murdered showing a house. Is it in Arkansas? 
No, it's in Canada. And a couple weeks ago, what inspired me to do that case is there was another real estate agent in Canada who was murdered while showing a house. So it's a real thing. Yeah. No, um, actually, I was going to follow. It's funny because I was going to follow up this episode with another realtor that got killed on the job in Arkansas. And it is unsolved. So. Damn. Should we just start a separate podcast? I mean, that's crazy. For our real estate agents? Gosh. <sighs> if you really think about it, it is so dangerous. And I hadn't really thought about it until I was researching this case that you basically go into a house, a private home with complete strangers, or you just open, you know, you're doing like a, what are they called? A open house and you just have people filtering in and out all day. It just seems so dangerous. Yeah, and you can't always have someone there with you. Yeah. I mean, real estate agents, I feel like, are, like, running from house to house doing, like, showings or, you know, whatever. And it's – you can't just, like, have a personal assistant go with you constantly. I know now a lot of people do, like, background checks before they show a house to someone. But even if it's someone who has no criminal history, like, you never know. You never know. I mean, well, the thing is, too, they gave the wife's name. I don't think – they gave the husband's name. He didn't have a criminal history. No. He did. Aaron did. What keeps you from just giving a fake name, you know? Fake name, fake phone number, all that. Yeah. Stay tuned for more real estate murders. Crazy. Stay safe out there, realtors. Part two coming in a couple weeks, I guess. That is Beverly Carter's story. And with that, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. If you want even more information, including photos of the case, you can check out our blog on OverMyDeadPod.com. Be sure to leave us a review wherever you're listening to this and check us out on social media at Over My Dead Pod. We'll see you next week with another case. Bye. Bye. Hello, and thank you for staying for overtime where we just chitter chatter away. Chitter chatter. So, Kylie's idea if you were a drink, Kylie, what drink would you be? I just so happen to be my favorite drink, a dirty vodka martini. A dirty vodka martini. I tried a martini not too long ago because I just want to be a I just want to be a martini girl. You know, I want to so bad. The aesthetic is so cute. It looks just adorable i want to be a martini girl they are so foul i know and i had you try the best martini i've ever had in little rock and you hated it and i was like okay well if you hate that one i don't think you're ever gonna like them Uh, i want to so bad maybe it can be an acquired taste but do i really want to acquire a taste for an alcohol i just don't know if i want to push myself that far that seems that seems like i'm going in the wrong direction (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to train myself to drink more. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm mean, Because a martini, it's not something you're going to drink 10 of them like on a night out. It's like a it's just like a casual sit at dinner or like in a lounge. Maybe after yeah. a hard day of work, you have one martini and you go to bed type of thing. Yeah, I could, I could get down with that. My favorite okay. drink and what I would say that I think I am is I've been loving a Cosmopolitan lately. Which I guess is just a fancy vodka cranberry with like a little bit of something else, maybe. I should probably know how to make my favorite drink, but I never make it. My- I never really make drinks myself. I'm If I'm drinking, I'm always socially drinking. I'm not just like drinking at home. Oh. Um, oh. I've never had a Cosmopolitan. I love them. And they, they make them in martini glasses and with the little mixers. So you get kind of mm-hmm. like the ice crystals. And I love that. It looks like a you drink, like aesthetically looking at it. I feel like that's, I feel like it's me. Like, because it's like fruity, but also like classy, pink. <laughs> pink. Kylie, yeah, pink. Yeah. Sometimes you say Cosmo if you're like feeling, you know, like a Cosmo. It's just like I had to graduate from getting a vodka crayon. Like, I would go to these nice restaurants with like a full bar and I felt ridiculous being like, can I have a vodka crayon? You know, it's just insufferable. So yeah, you can't go to like a, a black tie event and get a Tito Sprite. You can't go to a black tie event and get a Red Bull vodka. You just can't. Unfortunately, I wish we could. I mean, I'm going to need it at this age. I need a little like pick me up. 
Does anyone remember when Four Locos had caffeine and now they don't apparently? They don't? I thought there was like some, someone told me that something happened to Four Locos where they're not the same as they used to be when we were younger. Oh yeah. Yeah. They had a big lawsuit. Okay. When I was in college, my go-to drink or towards the end of it was a Red Bull vodka because I could stay up all night. Yes. And it tasted, it tasted good. It tasted just like Red Bull. Like you yeah. can't taste the vodka with it. It just tastes like gasoline. Yes. Whatever. The night of my graduation, I'm out with my dad and I'm, I've, I'm like five six deep at this point. And my dad goes, you know, heart attacks run in the family, right? <laughs> and that was the last time I had a Red Bull vodka. Oh gosh. I was like, oh, yep. My heart is going to explode. Down. Yeah. Now that you say that I am having a little bit of pitter patters. My hands are shaking. Do you think that Bloody Mary should be banned and should you be arrested if you order a Bloody Mary after 3 p.m.? I think so. To me, that's a brunch thing. Yeah. I love Bloody Marys. I love mimosas. If the sun's starting to set, it doesn't feel right to drink those. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think, well, I have, I don't have a good opinion because I really hate Bloody Marys. I think they're disgusting. Oh. I appreciate them. I appreciate like the thought of them. Like, I like that you can make them a meal, but I don't like tomato juice. So that's, you know, the whole problem. That's true. I don't like tomatoes, but for some reason I like them. It's so weird to me. You and I have so much in common. Our drink choices are complete opposite. Like you're red wine. Yeah. I'm white wine. I'm martini and Bloody Mary's. You're not. I'm not. You're Bloody Mary. I'm mimosa. Yep. Yeah. Kate drinks exclusively espresso martinis. She do be liking those espresso martinis. And Kate, um, for everyone that wants to know about her allergies, she is also allergic to, She is it wine? Yeah. Which makes Actually, it very hard. That does. That really does. Because it's in more things than you think. And she's not just allergic to wine. Champagne, too, right? Yeah. Okay. I guess it's a grape. I don't know. I mm. came across a video of us today at, um, gosh, where we at? That taco place in the Heights. Heights Tacos. <laughs> That's what we were at. And uh, we were taking shots of tequila. Oh, the glory days. Oh, I miss it. Yeah. If I did that today, I'd be hungover for three days shout out to little rock good restaurants good drinks yeah you know i dog on little rock but like even having been here for more time i've found just like the best restaurants they do have really good restaurants and the crime is high but honestly it's in just like splotches of the city like there's just some parts of the city that are so bad and then there's some parts that are so nice crazy nice and then crazy bad it's just like extreme difference of all the criminal activity in Little Rock is just like gang related. And as long as you're yeah. not associated with the gang, the only problem I ever had in living there for three years was when I left my car unlocked and someone stole all of my quarters. Oh, yeah. I remember the quarter thief. That was bad. I did get my car broken into, but I didn't really have anything to steal. So worked out, I guess. Oh, should we just go make some drinks? Um, I think I'm going to go make a drink. We'll catch you next time over my dad pod listeners. Please go like and subscribe. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to stop begging, actually. I'm not. Go like and follow and download our episodes so that we can keep doing this because we love it so much and we love you so much for supporting us. And that is the best way to show your support. I agree. Also, this is free for you guys and we don't have ads. No. Yeah. Support us. Support us, please. Please. We want to keep doing this. We love you. Anyways, I'm going to go make a Cosmopolitan. Bye. Bye.